excited to worship again together uh, tonight. Tonight's theme is the Word of God, and what an amazing tool God's Word truly is for us, and uh, a, a love letter really written to people. 2 Peter 1.4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises. Promises just for us in Scripture. So let's stand and sing, page 395, standing on the promises. Page 395, let's stand together as we sing, standing on the promises. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God my Savior, stand. Standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail. Standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing, standing. On that last together, standing on the promises I cannot fall, listening every moment to the Spirit's call, breathing in my Savior and my all in all, standing on the promises of God, standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing. Standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Amen. Well, it's good to see you back tonight. Glad you could be with us. And uh, looking forward to a good night together. And uh, Ty, would you mind leading us in prayer this evening? You may be seated as the choir sings.
theme this morning as God is our Father in that song. What a great truth that is. Continue looking at the word of God. The first words of this song say, How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. Page 578. Let's sing that together this evening. How firm a foundation. Page 578. Please come forward. We'll take tonight's tithes and offerings. And uh, of course, do remember uh, the Criswell family in prayer. Be with them and Darlene, and uh, just many that are that are recovering or, or sick right now. And uh, just ask the Lord to be with them. Tyler, would you mind praying for us for our offering? Thank you for that. Well, just a few announcements. I think most of you you've heard before, uh, but reminder: we're going to have not this next Sunday, but the following Sunday, the 31st, uh, Master Club. They're going to meet a half hour earlier. So parents, make a note of that. And they have some special things for the kids: some bounce houses, I think maybe even a hayride, that sort of thing. And so, uh, so that'll be on the 31st. So take note of that. And then we mentioned this morning, but Lucille is turning 95 in November. And we would like to do our best to encourage her. And so what they're doing is a card shower for her, hoping to get 95 cards uh, sent to her to encourage her on her birthday. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, get in touch with Wanda. You can either give her the card or she can get you the address. And that would be an encouragement to her, all right? 
And then I uh, want to remind you that we are doing our Christmas shoebox ministry, and uh, I believe November. Josh, do you remember that? Is that about when the cutoff date, mid-November? Um, so we've got about a month or so still. If you want to be part of that, they're doing weekly collections. Uh, I think this week was craft supplies, uh, or you can just do your own shoebox, and they send these out with the gospel uh, to kids all over the world, so it's a neat ministry there, all right? And then, of course, next Sunday is the big day. We're having our hog roast, and uh, that'll be a good time. So invite your non-vegan friends to come over on that day, and uh, we're, we're praying that'll be a good day next week. We're praying that uh, we're going to share the gospel, you know, in that, that Sunday morning message, and uh, we're praying God uses that. And, and so uh, be in prayer for that. Pray that God will use it, that God will have the people here that he wants here, and uh, it'll be a good day that we can rejoice in that, all right? Well, I think tonight our special Bo's singing for us, and so I've been looking forward to this. Bo, man, he's a talented, talented guy. I don't know if you know Bo or not, but the guy bowls on the bowling team. He's Sebastian in The Little Mermaid this year for the school play, so this guy does it all, so you're in for a treat. It'll be good tonight, all right? Well, Joe, why don't you come lead us in one uh, congregational, and then we'll have our special. Let's stand together and sing our final song, 181, Wonderful Words of Life. Let's stand and sing that, page 181, Wonderful Words of Life. Sing them over again to me, wonderful words of life. Let me more of their beauty see, wonderful words. together. Sweetly I go the gospel calls, wonderful words of life. Offer pardon and peace to all, wonderful words of life. Jesus only Savior, sanctify forever. Beautiful words, wonderful words, wonderful Great singing this evening. You may be seated. Creation sings the Father's song. He calls the sun to wake the dawn and run the course of day till evening falls in crimson rain. His fingerprints in flakes of snow, his breath upon this spinning globe. He charts the eagle's flight, commands the newborn baby's cry. Alleluia, little creation stand and sing. Alleluia, fill the earth with songs of worship. Tell the wonders of creation's King. Creation longs for his return. When Christ shall reign upon the earth, the bitter wars that rage are birth pains of a coming age. When he renews the land and sky, all heaven will sing and earth reply with one resplendent theme, the glory of our good and King. Alleluia, let all creation stand and sing. Alleluia, fill the earth with songs of worship. Tell the wonders of creation's king. Fill the earth with songs of worship. Tell the wonders of creation's king. Amen. Amen. Good.
good song there about what Christ has done in creation. An amazing thought. Well, we're going to be back in 1 Kings chapter number 18. We didn't quite finish this chapter. It would have been like three weeks ago now. Uh, so we'll be in 1 Kings 18. But if you don't mind, once you get to 1 Kings 18, also turn over to James chapter 5 and leave a finger in James chapter 5. We're going to kind of look at those two passages combined this evening. So 1 Kings chapter 18 and then also James chapter number 5. So we lived in uh, West Virginia for almost three years, and uh, Morgantown there. Morgantown, if you've never been to Morgantown, is very similar to kind of like a Muncie-type city, very similar size, has a college at the heart of it, kind of like Ball State for Muncie. And so we lived in Morgantown for a while, and we, we enjoyed Morgantown, but every once in a while, we just enjoyed going to the big city, all right? So Morgantown, it was a decent-sized city. But we always enjoyed going to the big city. Does anyone have a guess at what the big city would be closest to us in Morgantown? Anybody know? Pittsburgh. I heard that. Yes. So Pittsburgh was about an hour and 15 minutes north of Morgantown. And so maybe once a month, maybe once every six weeks or so, something like that, we would go to Pittsburgh and, and go to the different malls, go downtown, see different things in Pittsburgh. And we would enjoy our time there. It's, it's actually a really pretty city. When you think of Pittsburgh, you kind of think of ugly like armpit, stinky, <laughs> all right? The arm Pittsburgh. But no, Pittsburgh is actually a really pretty city as they have, have rivers flowing through um, the heart of Pittsburgh. And so we would enjoy our time in Pittsburgh. And so we would take that trip about an hour and 15 minutes. And there were certain times where we would be on the far side of Pittsburgh and we would come back home a different way than we came. All right, and so we were coming down and we were on a road called the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Anybody ever been on the Pennsylvania Turnpike before? All right, so we were on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, and, and as you could probably guess by the word turnpike, there was going to be a couple of things that came up along the way as we were making our way back home towards Morgantown. Something we all love and enjoy, tolls, right? And so we're, we're on our way back to Morgantown, and, and I've been through this before. I, I've gone the Pennsylvania Turnpike before. I've gone through these exact tolls, and so I was getting prepared. I see the sign, toll, two miles. Then I see the, the next sign, toll, one and a half miles, then one mile. And so I'm getting ready this entire time. Uh, I'm looking through, and this is one of these turnpikes where there's not a person there to take your money. And the last time we had gone through electronically, it messed us all up, and we ended up paying like three times what we were supposed to pay. And so I said, never again. I'm going through. I'm having exact change, and I'm going to be ready. I'm just going to put it right in the bill slot, and I'm making sure I'm not overcharged, and I'm making sure that we are just we're set to go. So we're getting ready. We're getting to close to the toll area, and, and Sam's picking out all the coins and everything. And so we, we get there, and I start trying to put the money into the slot. Now, there's one problem with that. I'm short. So I couldn't reach it. All right? And, and so I was ready, and, and, and I got all my money, and so I, I actually had to open my door. I, I rolled it all the way down, but I couldn't reach out the window. So I had to actually open my door and step outside of the car so that then I could put money in the toll machine, all right? So I've done everything right so far. I got the exact amount of change. I stopped where I was supposed to stop. I couldn't reach it. I opened the door. I'm ready to go. But as I was getting out of the car to put the money in, I forgot one very important thing. I didn't put the car in park, <laughs> and my legs aren't long enough to step on the brake and put the money in. So I would love to see the security footage from that day. <laughs> I mean, I jumped back in and, and finally got on the brake, put it in park, and then put my money in. But as I was getting all the details ready, I mean, I was down to the last penny, and, and I was prepared ahead of time and set to go, and I got there, and everything was ready. But I forgot probably the most important thing about it is to don't let your car run away from you. That's important. You need to keep the car, all right? And as I was going through, I forgot and I neglected the most basic thing. I got all the details right and the little things right and the extras right, but when it came down to it, I forgot the most basic thing of paying that toll. And many times in our Christian life, we can get the details right. We can get acts of service right. We can get interacting with other people correct. We, we can get coming to church and we can get all the, the outward look 
of a Christian life, but neglect the most basic things. And we do that in our regular life. We, we see that in sports where people do it. We see it when I was driving through and paying a toll where we get caught up in all the extras that we neglect the most important and most basic. And when we will look at the life of Elijah, one thing that made Elijah stand out, and actually if you were to look at any man of God throughout Scripture, is that they mastered the basics. They mastered the foundations of the Christian life. And I want us to look at just two basics this evening about what Elijah mastered, what he had down, and that was what set him up for success after that, was that he remembered the basics. And as Christians, we must get back to remembering the basics. So in 1 Kings chapter 18, we've, we've gone through most of this chapter. We've seen Elijah and the prophets of Baal and, and how God gave a great victory there. But I want us to look at the very beginning of this chapter, and then we'll look very at the very end, which we haven't looked at yet. Verse number 1, 1 Kings 18, says, And it came to pass after many days that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show thyself unto Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. The first basic I want you to see that Elijah catches a hold of is the promises of God. God gives a promise right here in verse number one. He gives an exact promise. He says, go show yourself to, unto Ahab and I will send rain upon the earth. That's a promise. He promises that rain will descend. Look in verse 41. This is after the victory against the prophets of Baal. Verse 41. And Elijah now is confident. Elijah now is acting on the promises that God gave in verse 1. In verse 41, And Elijah said unto Ahab, Get thee up, eat and drink, for there is a sound of abundance of rain. He didn't see a cloud in the sky. He, he didn't hear any thunder. He, he didn't see the, the storms in a great distance starting to roll in. No, he says, there's a sound of abundance of rain. Why did he say that? Because God made a promise in verse number one that it is going to rain. And so first we look at the promises of God. And this was a specific promise for the people of Israel, for Ahab, and for Elijah. A specific promise that God had for them. But aren't you thankful that God doesn't just give promises to the prophets in the Old Testament? God doesn't just give promises to the disciples that we see in the New Testament. God gives us living promises for us. Today. 2 Peter 1 verse 4 says, Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Peter himself says, There are promises. Not just promises for me, being the Apostle Peter. Not just promises for the Apostle Paul. Not just promises for Moses and Jacob and Abraham. But there are exceeding great and precious promises for you, believer. That's amazing. So what I want us to do as we continue looking at the promises of God, I want us to analyze them just really quickly. And, 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 and looking at that, kind of thinking of chemistry class. And uh, anybody ever have to take chemistry class? couple of you, or maybe even biology class, and my favorite part of chemistry class or biology class was lab days, right? And we would, we would go and we would start looking under something so we could look very closely at small organisms called a microscope. And we would look under that microscope and we would study and, and see everything that's underneath and the, the cell makeup and, and the shapes of the cells and everything that has to do with that organism underneath the microscope. We would look at it and then we would have to think about it. It wasn't enough to just look at it and say, oh, that's cool. No, our teachers required some thought from us. They required some process on our part. And so we looked at them, and then we also had to write down and, and think through all the different parts that are making up this thing underneath the microscope. And what I want us to do is we're going to take the promises of God, and that's a large, big, over-encompassing thing in, the, in God's Word. And I want us to look at the promises of God and just zero in on them a little bit. 
that we'll take time to analyze them and what these promises are for. What promises are for us? What promises aren't for us? What promises can we, can we take action and claim? And what promises can we kind of just read through and say, oh, that was great. God made a promise here for someone else. So I want us to look at a couple of different promises. And so first we're going to analyze God's promises. First, I want us to see there's personal promises and there are universal promises. Personal promises, universal promises. This would be an example with Elijah here of a personal promise. God made this promise to Elijah, the individual. He did not make this promise to me. He did not make this promise to us. This is a promise to Elijah. We cannot claim a promise God has given to Joshua and, and go out to Lafayette, Indiana and start marching around Purdue's Mackey Arena seven times and hope that it falls down. All right? That's not a promise for me. That was a promise for Joshua. We can't go out fishing and go on the boat and, and put our net on one side, and then at the end of the day when we've been unsuccessful, then we suddenly throw it to the other side and have a ton of fish in our boat. That was a promise for Peter. That wasn't a promise for us. But I find many times that promises can be taken out of context. We take something that God has said to an individual in Scripture and think that, oh, because God said it to this individual person at this individual time, I can claim that. That's not necessarily the case. And so we have personal promises when God gives an exact promise at an exact time to an exact person for an exact purpose. That's personal. But we also have some universal promises. Universal promises are these promises are for all people at all times. Anyone can claim these promises. It wasn't just to an individual. Let me give you some great examples. And as I was reading through just some examples of universal promises, these are promises that God makes to each and every one of us. Psalm 103.11 says, For as the heaven is high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward them that fear him. So we have the promise of mercy. As far as the east is from the west, so far hath he removed our transgressions from us. We have the promise of forgiveness. Like a father pitieth his children, so the Lord pitieth them that fear him. We have the promise of pity and mercy and grace. Isaiah 41.10 says, Fear thou not, I am, the, I am with thee. We have the promise of God's presence. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. We have the promise of a personal God, thy God. I will strengthen thee. We have the promise of strength. Yea, I will help thee, the promise of help. I will uphold thee with thy right hand of my righteousness, the promise of God's character, the promise of God upholding us. Matthew 7, 7, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find, knock and it shall be opened to you. For everyone that asketh receiveth. You see that's universal, he says everyone. And he that seeketh findeth and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. This is probably my favorite promise, but in Romans 10, 13 says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The promise of salvation is a universal promise. Philippians 4.19, But my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. A universal promise that God supplies our need. Last one, 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be in the Lord. The promise of eternal life. The promise of heaven. And the promises that we can claim, they're universal promises. And that's just a sampling. That's just six of the universal promises we can find in Scripture. That as we analyze God's promises, there's some that are not meant for us. But I'm thankful that there are a great many that are meant for us. There are universal promises meant for God's people. So we see the, the difference, universal and personal. But not only is there universal and personal, there's also conditional and unconditional. Conditional promises, unconditional promises. An example of a conditional promise, when, when I was younger and Dad would preach... It was a standing promise that if he used me as an illustration, afterwards, we were getting ice cream. You remember that? <laughs> I loved that promise, <laughs> right? But it was conditional. It was, son, if I use you as an illustration, 
then we will go get ice cream. Conditional promise. He had to mention me in the illustration for the promise of ice cream to come through. Right? There are other days where before church, dad would just say, hey, guys, we're going to go get ice cream after the service. I like that even better because there was no downside. It was just goodness, right? And, and that, that promise, it was then unconditional. It didn't matter what was taking place. It didn't matter if he used me in an illustration or not. He promised we were going to go get ice cream after the service, and so we did. Nothing had to take place on my part. Nothing had to take place on his part. It was a promise that was completely unconditional. And we have these promises that God gives us where some of them, they put some responsibility on us. Conditional promises. Just a few examples of this. Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him and he shall direct thy paths. The promise is he will direct your paths. That's a great promise. That's an amazing promise. And God gives us that promise. But there's a condition. You have to acknowledge him in all your ways. It's a conditional promise. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There's a condition there. God wants to forgive. God wants to cleanse. But responsibility falls on us. James 4, 8 says, draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. God wants a relationship. God wants to be close, but there's responsibility on our part to draw close to him. Conditional promises. And many times we can try to claim the promises of God without taking any responsibility. Elijah here, this was a conditional promise. He said, go show yourself to Ahab, then I'm going to bring rain. Elijah receives a conditional promise here, and he follows through. He does what he is told to do, and God fulfills his promise because Elijah held up his end of the deal. And many times we can look at God's word and say, why is he not directing me? Why does it feel like we're so far apart? Well, it's because many times we neglect our responsibilities when it comes to promises. So we see conditional promises, but I'm also very thankful for unconditional promises. Unconditional promises. Psalm 119, 105 says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Unconditional. God's word will guide. Titus 2.11, For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. The promise that Jesus will come, did come. He did die. That was a promise that God fulfilled. Hebrews 16 says, For God is not unrighteous to forget your work, and labor of love which ye have showed toward his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. The unconditional promise that God does reward and does remember his saints and the life they live for him. Unconditional promises. And so as we analyze God's promises, how do we then take the next step? So we've looked at Elijah's promise, this personal, conditional promise that Elijah is now given. And we see that there are Promises made to us. And some of those promises are conditional. Some of those promises are unconditional. But God does have promises for us. And now we've analyzed those. And we've seen what those promises are. But it's not enough just to analyze them. It's not enough just to study promises. We then have to put those promises into action. So not only analyzing the promises of God, promises of God but adapting the promises of God. In our car, at the very front, there's a circular outlet. And that was used, used to be used for cigarettes or whatever it might be. And, and there's that outlet. And I want to charge my phone through my car. What do I have to buy first? I can't just plug it into that. The, the, the phone cord doesn't fit into this, right? That doesn't work. I have to buy an adapter, something that takes the power there, and converts it into usable energy that I can now take advantage of. And when we look at the promises of God, we must not only know that they're there and realize there's power in them, but we must also convert them 
to where now we use them, to now we can claim them, to now they actually make an impact in our lives, adapting them. So how do we adapt promises? How do we make promises actually helpful for us? Well, first, we must actually know what God's promises are. I've given just a brief couple of examples. You could read and read and read, and you will completely and always find new promises of God. But you have to know that they're there. You have to listen for the word of God. We see Elijah, he was always attentive to God's word. He listened to what God had to say. So you must first be in God's word and know his promises. It's also very helpful to memorize God's promises. David alludes to this. He says, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Many times it's helpful for us when we take God's promises that are universally meant for us, conditional or unconditional, and we memorize them. So it changes the way that we live. Not only memorize them, not only just know them, but then we must meet the conditions if there are conditions to meet. If we want God to lead us, we have to acknowledge him. If we want God to forgive us, we have to confess. And there are so many promises in God's word that are conditional. And so if we are to adapt them and actually have the power of God's promises in our life, we have to hold up our end of the conditions, much as Elijah did here. And so we see we also must Put them into practice in that way. But we see, and this leads us into our second point, the fourth way that we can put God's promises and adapt them for our lives is that we can pray God's promises. And that's our second basic tonight is prayer. And I don't mean to, to mimic or, or take anything that Brian said, this Pastor Brian said this morning, which was a fantastic message, especially when hinting on prayer there. But it's a basic. It is a foundational core of the Christian life is prayer. And we see that consistently in the life of Elijah. And so if we are to adapt and take on the promises of God, we must also pray the promises of God. And we see that Elijah did that here at the end of this chapter in 1 Kings number 18. So we're going to look at prayer as our second basic. So first, our, our first basic that we must return to is the promises of God analyzing them and knowing what promises are for me, memorizing them, meeting the conditions, and praying them. Many times prayer is an overlooked part of our Christian life. Many times it's, if we're going to neglect something in our life, usually it's prayer. What we can always spend more time doing is praying. Many times we forget that prayer in and of itself is a ministry. And many times we can think that, oh, I can't sing very well, and so I can't be in the choir, sing special music, and, and I'm not a very talented speaker, so I can't teach Sunday school, or, or I, I can't um, help out in different areas. But God puts a high value on the ministry of prayer. And that's something, even if you feel like you are not gifted in certain areas to be used in the church, God uses prayer. We actually see that in Acts 6, verses 3 and 4, where this is a set-aside ministry that individuals would pray. It says, Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. In verse 4, But we will give ourselves continually to prayer. And if you feel like God doesn't use you in other areas, God still uses your prayer. And everyone can pray. Anyone can pray. And we see how Elijah prayed here, but many times it's a neglected part of our Christian lives. And we treat it as kind of a, an add-on whenever maybe we need it. Whenever we're in an emergency. Whenever someone texts us a prayer request, then we'll pray. Maybe on Wednesday night when we come to, to Bible study, then we'll pray. But prayer is a continually needed ministry. I love this quote. This is a quote by Corey Ten Boom. And she asked the question, is prayer your steering wheel or is prayer your spare tire? And many times we treat prayer like a spare tire. I'll use it when I need it. I'll use it when I need something or when it seems like someone else needs something. When, when life is hard, then, then I can pray. 
But the thought process is, is that prayer is not to be used as a spare tire in an emergency. Prayer is your steering wheel. It's what drives the car. It's what keeps you going. It, it's what controls each and everything. God listens to prayer. And I want us to look at the prayer of Elijah. Now, if you were to look in 1 Kings 18, you actually don't see Elijah praying. You don't see where it says Elijah called on the name of the Lord. You don't see where Elijah prayed before God. But if you turn to James chapter 5, which hopefully we are in, we get a little extra sneak peek of 1 Kings chapter 18. And I want us to look at prayer and how Elijah prayed and how in our lives we ought to pray from the example that Elijah gives us. So James chapter 5 and verse number 16. Verse number 16. 16 says this, Confess your faults one to another, and pray for one another, that ye may be healed. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Verse 17, Elias, or Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain. And the earth brought forth her fruit. So we do see Elijah prayed. Elijah prayed the first promise of God, and Elijah prayed the second promise of God when it came to rain. And I want us to look at very briefly, the second basic of prayer on how Elijah gives us the example on how to pray, the spirit we are to have when praying. Verse 16, the second sentence there says, the effectual, fervent prayer. Effectual, fervent prayer. That word, effectual, fervent, in the original is actually one Greek word. And that word is energeo, energeo which sounds an awful lot like and is where we get the English word energy, energy. And it says that Elijah prayed with energy. He prayed with power and he prayed with effort. He prayed with effort. We were driving down Highway 3 and every single business has something in their window or on their sign. What is it? Now hiring or help wanted, right? And they'll even give you a pay bonus. They'll give you everything. And why is that? It's, be, it's because the culture today has a fear of work. I don't want to put the effort in. I don't want to put the energy in. I don't want to take the time to go do that. And now we see every single place is hiring because no one wants to put in effort. And hopefully none of us have that attitude. Hopefully our attitude is, I'm going to work hard. And I'm going to work hard at, at my job. I'm going to work hard when I'm in the home, whatever projects need done. I'm going to work hard when I come to church. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work hard in whatever situation it is that we would put forward a great, strong effort. But many times when it comes to the action of prayer, we take on the attitude of the culture. We don't put in the energy. We, we don't put in the time. We don't put in the effort. And we see Elijah actually, he comes back seven different times. He, he takes the effort, he takes the time, and, and he had an effectual, fervent prayer, energeo, energetic, full of effort prayer. When was the last time you tried in your prayer life? When was the last time you focused in and said, I will pray this long? I will pray for these things. I, I'm going to take the time to continually think on what I should be praying. I'm going to put in the effort into my prayer life. And we see Elijah, he, he puts in the energy. He gives a great effort in his prayers. Many times I find that my prayers are lazy. They're not specific, as Brian mentioned this morning. They're quick. They're to check off a box because Christians are supposed to pray. Elijah didn't pray that way. Elijah prayed with energy. Elijah prayed with effort. How much effort are you putting into your prayer? 
Not only did he pray with energy, he also prayed with integrity. Integrity. And I know that starts with an I and not an E. Maybe that will help it stand out a little more. But we see this. Continuing that sentence of the end of verse 16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Not just any old man, not a sinful man, a righteous man. He prayed with integrity. He prayed with a character that would be categorized as holiness. He he prayed with a life that was blameless and spotless. When he came before God. And we actually see this as as an additional promise that God gives. In Psalm 66, 18, God gives another promise. He says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, it's a condition. The Lord will not hear me. That's a promise from God. If you are not praying with integrity and as, as it describes Elijah, a righteous person. If you're regarding iniquity in your heart, your prayers don't avail to much. Some of you have maybe heard the story. In the uh, Amazon jungles, there are several different animals. And one of my favorites are monkeys. I love monkeys. Monkeys are so much fun. If I go to the zoo, I'm just sitting there watching the monkeys hang out and play and swing. I love monkeys. And so to catch these different monkeys, there is, there is uh, this man, and he came up with the process of catching monkeys. And what he would do is he would take a coconut, and he would cut a small hole on the top of that coconut, and he would drain it completely. And he would hang those out for the different monkeys, and, and what he would do is he would fill the bottom of those coconuts with rice or banana or whatever food monkeys enjoy. And he'd put that in the coconut, and and the monkeys would then reach in and grab whatever's inside. Now, the thing is that that hole that he had cut was pretty small. It was so small that the the monkeys had to really make their hand pretty slender to get in. And they would grab what was at the bottom, and now that their hand is all balled up and has the food, they could not then take their hand out. They couldn't let go. They wouldn't let go. And the monkeys would sit there, and they would, they would cry, and they would scream, and they would hope for help. But they wouldn't let go. And they were going crazy. They were going bananas. <laughs> because they're stuck there. They're begging and pleading and crying and hoping that someone will help them. But what's the problem? All you had to do was let go, and you're free. And many times we approach our prayer life, we will beg God, we will plead God, we will hope that God will help us, but we won't let go of our sin. We're stuck. We're praying and, and hoping God helps us, but if we regard iniquity in our heart, He will not hear me. And so we must have the, the spirit of the psalmist in Psalm 51.10, Create in me a clean heart, O Father. Renew a right spirit in me. Try me. Know my thoughts. See if there's any wicked way in me. Lead me in the way everlasting. When you are coming to pray, you better pray with integrity. Because if you aren't a righteous man, as Elijah is described, and you are hanging on, you can cry all you want. But there's separation. You're not close with God. He is not hearing you. Because we don't have integrity when we pray. Thirdly, we see that Elijah also prayed earnestly. He prayed earnestly. And this is a word we don't use all that often, earnest prayer. The word earnest is just not usually in our dictionary. But we see this. Verse 17, Elijah was a man subject to like passions as we were, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. You know what that word earnestly actually means? And if you were to look at kind of the original how it goes how it goes back is that it, it means that he prayed with prayer in other words it means he really prayed he really prayed and he took the time he was passionate about what he was praying he prayed a real prayer and there are things that we are passionate about i remember when i was young 
And I'm still this way, but I love basketball. And I remember going to one of Brian's games when he was in high school. Maybe it was even junior high. And it was an intense game. Back and forth against a rival team. Tough, tough game. And I remember at the end of that game, I think we lost. At least I hope we lost. Because my reaction really means that we should have lost. Because I was bawling. I was crying so hard. I mean, the tears were streaming. And my face was completely red. And I was... I was sobbing at the fact that we lost a basketball game, a junior high basketball game. I was really caring. I was really passionate about what was going on. And that's how Elijah prayed. I mean, he really prayed. He was passionate. He was caring. Many times we can make a list and we go through our list. We are unaffected by the burdens of others. We are unaffected by the world. We are unaffected by the sin. We just pray. We don't really pray. That's what earnestly means. Passionately. With care. With devotion. And that's how Elijah prayed. And that's how we need to pray. Do we pray earnestly? And the last one, we'll close with this. But Elijah also prayed expectantly. He prayed expectantly. Verse 41, he comes right up to Ahab and he says, get ready because there's a sound of rain. The rain hadn't come yet. It hadn't even started sprinkling. But Elijah said, get ready because God made a promise. I prayed on the promise and I'm expecting it. I'm ready for it to happen. And he told Ahab, rain is coming. They hadn't seen rain in three years and six months. And Elijah says, it's coming. I know my God will answer. And that is the attitude Elijah took in when he prayed expectantly. Why was he able to pray expectantly? Why was he able to pray and know that God would hear him? Because going back to our first basic, Elijah prayed for the promises And in our prayers, we can truly pray expectantly when we are praying, as Brian said this morning, the heart of God. We are praying for what God desires. We are praying for what God promises. And that is when we can pray and be completely and fully expectant of an answer. When we go back to the promises of God. When we look at the basics. The promises of God in prayer. And many times we neglect these things. Just last week, it was my birthday, turned 27 last Saturday, October 9th. And I got some really cool things. All right? I'm 27, but I still love getting gifts. All right? And so I got some great things. Got some IU basketball tickets. I'm super excited for that. And one other gift that I got that Sam got me is she got me a brand new smoker. Not like cigarettes, but like it smokes... <laughs> Smokes meat, all right? Wood pellets, and you put it in there, and you could, you know, put, put pork in there and just let it smoke and smoke and get such great flavor. And, and so she gave me that last Saturday, and I was thrilled. So that way, I mean, the first thing I did is that, that night I got the smoker in the morning. The afternoon I was going and I was buying food, all right? I, I got to get some food to put on the smoker so we can eat it. So I did that. And and the next day, I I, I did the same thing, two days in a row. And yesterday, I made something yesterday, and I made something the day before. She's loving this gift because I'm the one cooking now, right? (laughs) And I love this gift, and it's really neat. I love it, and it has all the different thermostat where you can just put it exactly where you want it, and it's going to stay there. I don't have to keep coming out and checking it or maybe thinking it might catch on fire and burn the house down, right? It's, It's really safe. But one of the best things that came with part of that gift is there is a plug-in to the front, and it's a little metal rod. And you stick that into whatever you're cooking, and it tells you what the inside internal temperature is of whatever you're cooking. I love that because then I'm not cutting into things. Is it red? Is it not? Okay, back, right? I I can just put that in, and it'll tell me what's going on. I know what's happening. 
It tells me all the insides, and, and, and now I can just relax because I know what the internal temperature is, and I'm going to cook it to perfection every time because I just follow that. Charles Spurgeon had a great quote. He says, I know of no better thermometer to your spiritual temperature than this. The measure of the intensity of your prayer, your devotion to scripture. You want to know how close you are to God? You want to know how you're actually doing in your Christian life? It's not about just coming to church on Sunday and Wednesday. It's not about being a good testimony, although those are great things. You want to know what your internal heart is? How are you doing on the basics? Have you spent time with God? Have you taken his promises and you know them so much that you can now live them? So much that you can now pray them and your prayers are now full of passion and integrity and energy and with expectancy. We need to get back to the basics. And may we do that. Be in his word. Stand on his promises. And have a strong prayer life. Let's close in a word of prayer before we have an invitation. Dear Lord, we thank you for these lessons we can learn from Elijah. God, I ask that you would help us as Christians to now be focused on the basics. That we would look into your word and understand your promises and, and be able to use them for our lives. And God, that we would pray your promises and have a prayer life that is truly committed to you. God, I ask that you would help all of us, that we would not be distracted by the externals, but that we would get back to the basics in our Christian life, and our internal temperature would truly reflect you. I ask that you would bless us the rest of this evening. Thank you for all you've done for us. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's stand together and sing page 494, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. We'll sing that verse together. Page 494, if you need to make a decision, if you know you've neglected the basics in your life, if you know your prayer life has not been what it should be, if you know that you haven't been in God's word the way you ought, why don't make a commitment now that you would get the basics correct in your life. Take the time to do that now as we sing page 494, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me after Brother Mike Herman, would you mind closing us in prayer tonight?